Hello, I'm Richard Corns, Chief Executive of the British Council for Offices, the BCO, and welcome to the latest in a series of interviews I'm conducting with prominent members. We are calling the new normal. Now, this week we focus on architecture, and where better to turn than one of that profession's leading practitioners, Ken Shuttleworth. Now, Ken studied at the Leicester School of Architecture, where his fluid draftsmanship earned him the nickname Ken the Pen, which I rather like. He spent the early part of his career at Foster and Partners and was very much Norman Foster's right-hand man. At Foster's, he worked on some of the world's most iconic office projects, including, of course, the HSBC headquarters in Hong Kong and 30 St. Mary Axe in London, better known as the Gherkin. In 2004, Ken left Foster and Partners to found Make Architects, where the firm's first major new commission was the reimagination of the former Marks and Spencer headquarters in Baker Street. But as I often say at this stage, more important than any of that is Ken's involvement with the BCO, which is extensive and deep. From the very start, pretty much, this includes his role as a National Awards judge, his chairmanship of the annual conference in London in 2017 and his presidency of the BCO in 2017-18. So welcome Ken. Hi Richard, how are you doing? Very well thank you and thank you very much for taking part in this interview and I'll start I'll start if I may Ken um, with your sort of personal position in the lockdown. So as an architect how is the lockdown changing how you work? I mean, I think it's changed absolutely everything. You know, we've got 168 people working from home uh, on their kitchen tables all around the world, in Australia, Hong Kong, uh, London, Austria, all over the place. Um, and we've all uh, been there for, it must be six weeks now, I think. Um, and what's interesting is all the projects that are sort of, you know, in design stage, uh, on the drawing board, as I would say, I mean, they're all carrying on. I mean, they're, you know, they're still, people drawing, there's meetings going on all day long uh, on, on um, Microsoft Teams and, uh, and Zoom and things. Um, it's just, you know, there's just things are still happening um, and projects are still being designed and being, you know, talked about. Um, everything that hap everything's on site has stopped or had stopped. It's just about to reopen, I think. Um, and that's been a big change so that all the, all the projects on site, we had one with about four or five days towards completion and that stopped as well. So there's been, um, in a way sort of two edges to it um the sort of site work which has all stopped and then the you know, design work was carried on um when i think it's just been it's been interesting because you realize you're relying on people's um internet connections so like yours here richard you know i mean you're just relying completely on the internet connection being the right you know the right level um and i've already been up a tree with a saw trying to make sure you know my internet connection doesn't go down um you know it's, it's one of those things where we did a we did a pitch actually to some potential clients must have been last two weeks ago and he couldn't see anything he couldn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> and he was somewhere presumably in the cotswolds with uh you know with a sort of lousy connection um so he just could hear us but couldn't see any of our images so it was a bit frustrating so what we've been doing um in terms of presentations we've been really sort of watering down uh, you know graphics to you know simpler graphics no fly-through films no sensitive you know, um, you know things that take a lot of broad bandwidth um, so you know we're doing very simple presentations um, you know almost just flat images and words to try and reduce the amount of uh, bandwidth that people have to have to actually take some of these uh, the more whizzy stuff that we normally do so I think we've changed absolutely everything. I mean, we I can't think of anything that's the same, really. No, it is it is quite remarkable. And sort of two things that really struck me in the, in this crisis is is one how quickly we've all adapted to to working in a completely different way as we've become yeah. businesses in our own heads. And secondly, how broadly the technology has has coped. I mean, with a few glitches, as yeah. you as you your example <clears throat> illustrates, Ken. But generally, it's worked astonishingly well. And the and the broadband infrastructure just seems to cope somehow. 
considering this well, is the way to think, you know we did we did plan for it and we did actually um you know had a few weeks warning with this was going to happen so we did actually sort of upgrade things and we did actually super test everything and we tested all the because the big programs are the um that we're using um the, the revit programs you know which are basically up in the cloud um, we stress tested all that from people's broadband at home <clears throat> to make sure it actually works because that's where all the you know the way the work's being done on mm. people's kitchen tables but the um, the models are actually um, being produced through their computers in the office so their computers actually in the studio are still fired up and they're getting access to those computers which are then going up to the cloud to work on the on the big Google mo uh, the big um, Revit models <clears throat> and it's that connection then from you to your computer at home that's the most important and always the weakest link some people haven't got you know a great connection um, but yeah I think it has worked you know we're still still getting paid you know we're still earning money we've still got uh, everybody we only furloughed about 10 people um, who got absolutely no way they could actually do anything because they were either looking after the studio or they were photographers or you know you can't go out and take a photograph at the moment um, but everybody else we've kept on and we haven't um, we just kept going we haven't Fantastic. stopped that is very encouraging. Let's turn, if, if I may, Ken, to the workplace and accepting where we are, how do you think workplace design might change as a result of the coronavirus? Well, we're looking now at our uh, return to the studio. So we've got an exercise going on, how we get back in. Um, and we're assuming we're gonna get back in, in sort of steps. We're not gonna go back in as if we just left. Um, so we're looking at what that actually means. And there's been lots of conversations about, you know, the workplace of the future. Um, I mean, I think the immediate 12 months, if when we do get back in, will be every desk has to be two meters apart. Um, we have to have one-way systems in corridors. Um, we'd have to have um, no meetings. You know, I mean, the, the interesting thing is to go to our Hong Kong studio, which has actually been fully operational pretty much throughout. And what they have to do, they have thermometers to check them going in and out of the building. Um, they have um, they have to be supposed to be two meters apart. They have to wear face masks whenever they go outside. Um, and in a way, Hong Kong's like the future for what we're going to be like in London. I think mm. all the streets disinfected all the time. <clears throat> you know, restaurants have got every other table closed down. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a sort of different way of thinking. Actually, there's um there's a in Beijing. There's things like <clears throat> when you go into a lift, there's like a little cut. Um, a little sort of polystyrene thing with matchsticks in it like a little hedgehog that sits in the lift car and you pick one out and you push the lift car button you drop it into a little plastic container and so you can go so you haven't got, actually got to touch the lift shaft button okay. and i think the chinese did a lot of this when the sars um, happened in hong kong um, so they're sort of more prepared i think than we are for for the sort of um, what's now going to be called the new normal we've done a, an exercise where we um, alternate desks, so everybody, you have everybody in a, um, one set of desks, so the, the red team go in on a Monday and a, and a Wednesday, uh, the blue team go in on a Tuesday and a Thursday, and they sit at alternate desks, so they're not using the same desks. Um, we can get about a half a studio back. I'm sure you're right, Ken, and I think what, what has been lost on some perhaps until relatively recently is that, you know, in the absence of a, of a vaccine, then social distancing remains. And that's, that's going to stay, that's going to be around for quite a long time to come. It and it, we're just going to have to get used to that when we do get that. I, th I think that's right. I mean, a vaccine is the only way out. Let's move on, if I may, to, to what the market might want. And, and once we come into a, you know, a more normal world, whatever the new normal m might look like, do you think there will still be an appetite for major workplace projects? I think people will want to go back to the studios and back to work. I think there will be a requirement. Um, you know, people crave it. People want the restaurants, they want the cafes, they want the social interaction. So I think um, there'll be a transition. There'll be some people who probably will retire through this process. They won't bother to go back, um, you know, especially if it takes a year. Um, you know, those of us over um, nearly 70 or nearly over 65 are, you know, in a way vulnerable. So I think, you know, us going back anytime soon is, it's probably not going to happen to be honest so we're going to, have to get used to this um <clears throat> but i think there will be a requirement that you know people will have to you know will want to have um to go back to the offices but they, i think it will be different there'll be two meters apart there'll be more spacing there'll be more petitions there'll be more um you know arrows on the floor like in hospitals to get to the toilets there'll be um you know wash hand basins with automatic taps there'll be automatic flushing where no touch surfaces on you know so the flush on a toilet just you wave your hand rather than touch the button 
um, I think there'll be fundamental changes. I think you're absolutely right, Ken. I think, you know, there will be lots of changes that none of us have thought of yet. That things will just be different, but it will be radical. But I absolutely agree with your point as well about how exhausting this is all, all is. You know, you, you, in some ways you think that working from home was easy and relaxing, and it, and it isn't. It's actually, it's, it's <laughs> things that were relatively simple take a lot longer. And it is very hard work, isn't it? And it is. Yeah, you talk about the traveling, but even so, it, they are long days. And the hard ones, but I'll 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 move on if um, if I'm if I may to uh, to a few other areas. And in terms of of what the sector can do, how do you think the office world can respond most positively to to the crisis? What do you think is the how can we you know as a as a sector how can we step up? I think we have to fundamentally analyse what we would need to do to make offices feel safe i think that the way the buildings have to be redesigned to actually cope because <clears throat> you know this may happen again this may not just be the only time we get this there might be a you know covid 20 who knows um <clears throat> you know it seems likely that it's just not you know unless you get a vaccine we're not going to get over this one but it's going to be another one after this um so mm. i think it's going to become a, a point where buildings will need to really respond to that so more generous lifts you know two ways in and out of a toilet i mean there's lots of things that you can think about that we'd have to change um and in a way it's you know it's good for us to have a, a challenge you know how do you make sure that you your building is um you know more is better designed than somebody else's building you know for for a pandemic i mean i think that's quite a architecture that's brilliant brilliant sort of challenge to sort of think it think it through how could you do it that I think to look at the Far East, um, you know, is probably where we should be looking and what, what changes are actually happening there um, that will affect us here. But I mean, I think disinfecting stuff, you know, having materials that don't hold um, a germ for 72 hours, you know, which is horrendous, you know, got to wait that long before you can actually pick something up. Um, you know, so I think the use of the type of materials as well. Um, I think air conditioning systems, you know, where you recirculate all the air. So if you're sitting on a, on a an ocean going liner, you know, all the air is being recirculated around um, and everybody's connected together. Um, you know, and a lot of buildings, except for, I think, operating theatres pretty much operate on the, you know, on a, uh, don't operate 100% fresh air, they basically operate on recirculating air, which you do in offices. I think there'll be a lot of move away from doing some of that into much more fresh air, less recirculation of air, uh, more filtration. You know, people just want to be asking, you know, the clients will be asking those questions about that, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, Ken. Um, and just just one last one, if, if, if I may, I'm conscious of time, but in terms of the profession, the, the architectural profession, how do you think it will fare in the wake of the, of the economic downturn, which is undoubtedly around the corner? I think... I think a lot of people will go down because they haven't got any cash. I mean, what I've always maintained the view that we need to have our own cash in the bank and not take out loans. <clears throat> um, you know, make, when Make was set up, we, we worked on positive cash flow. We've never had a loan um, so far. And I think that's been, in a way, our savior. It's that, it's that great, um, was it Mark Twain who says, um, a banker will lend you an umbrella when the sun's shining, but then wants it back as soon as it starts to rain. And I've always felt that as a, I mean, been through 2008 um, as well. I always felt that was, you know, to be heeded was quite good advice. And I spoke to bank managers about it as well. They said, yeah, that's probably about right. You know? <laughs> so I think if you've got the cash in the bank to keep you going for three months, um, I think you're okay. If this goes on for six months, I think everybody will be, you know, you haven't got enough, probably haven't got enough cash to keep 100% going for six months. So I think it's a matter of how long it goes on, when we can get people back in. Um, obviously, if the clients keep paying, it's fine. If they stop paying and they want to sort of, you know, a year's rest or something, uh, I think that's a problem. But I think a lot of people will suffer. I think, you know, it's, you know, we are fee based. Um, you know, you can only get paid for what you do. There's, you know, there's no, no, you can't sell anything. You know, you have to basically work on a fee basis. Um, and normally we just earn the fees to pay the guy's salaries. That's, you know, it's not that difficult to understand how we all work. Um, and if the money doesn't come in, we can't pay the salaries. So you need the buffer. Because um, mm. if you haven't got a buffer, you have to borrow money and you can't borrow money at the moment. And you wouldn't want to borrow money at the moment, even though being in Indeed so. And, and as you say, Ken, potentially some very tough times ahead. 
Sadly, we are out of time, um, but I'm very, very grateful to you. It's been absolutely fascinating. As always, Ken, it's always a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you've all enjoyed this brief chat as much as I have. And from Ken and me, thank you and goodbye.